Hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Neil Gray. I'm the member of the Scottish Parliament for Airdrie and Shots, and also the convener of the Scottish Parliament's Social Justice and Social Security Committee. I would like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021, in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. Uh, this afternoon's panel is titled Radical Solutions to Poverty, Give Everyone £5,200. And it's held in partnership with Glasgow Caledonian University. We're delighted that so many people are able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing comments and questions from you as we get into our discussion. With one in four children in Scotland living in poverty, and the vast majority within working households, is it now time to get radical and adopt a universal basic income? What other radical solutions are out there that would mitigate the detrimental effects of generations of poverty? This panel aims to address all these big questions in the next 60 minutes, so do stay with us. We are delighted that you are all able to join us to take part, and I would encourage you all to use the event chat function to introduce yourselves, stating your name, your geographical location, and pose any questions you would like to the panel to respond to. I am really pleased uh, to be joined by our three panellists uh, today, an illustrious uh, panel. Uh, Professor John McKendrick, uh, who is Scottish Poverty and uh, Inequality Research Unit at Glasgow University, at uh, Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, I've had a lot of engagement with John in the past on these issues, so I'm really pleased to have John along today. Uh, we also have Wendy Harty, uh, Basic Income Project Manager of the, the Steering Group, uh, again, Wendy has done a lot of work uh, in this area, so really looking forward to her insight. And we're also hoped, uh, hoping to be joined by Russell Gunson, uh, who is the director of IPPR Scotland, uh, the Institute for Public Policy Research. Um, there will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you would like to make a contribution, please enter them into the uh, question and answer box. Make sure to state your name uh, and where uh, where you are this afternoon, and we'll get through as many as possible. However, I'd like to begin by asking each of our panellists uh, the first question, to summarise uh, concisely uh, what your definition of a universal basic income is, and how that could work in Scotland. I'd like to come first to uh, Professor John McKendrick, and then uh, Wendy Harty, please. Uh, thanks very much, Neil. Well, it's an uh, acronym overload. You've got UBI, you've got UBS, you've got uh, MIG, and you could maybe throw in LW and SSS. And I'm sure we'll go on to, to all of them. But the one you've asked about then, the universal basic income, it's a very straightforward idea in theory, and that's that we give people an income that's enough to cover the basics in life, and that would apply to every citizen. Um, some would suggest that perhaps the payment could vary by age, that there could be a larger payment for adults and a smaller payment for children. But the thinking is then basically to cover the basics, and that we do that then through one simple, straightforward payment uh, that would go to individuals, or indeed uh, the individual's parent. Nice and simple. Do you ask, you ask me to keep it nice and simple? I, I can do that, Neil. I can deliver something. <laughs> You did indeed. Thank you very much indeed, John. Wendy, uh, would you like to come in as well around your vision, what you would see a UBI looking like in Scotland, uh, what your research work has shown you from the work that you've already been doing with the steering group? Yeah, thanks, Neil, and thanks, John, and it's, it's lovely to be here this afternoon. So I agree with John. He he um, covered the the basics nicely. So um, just to kind of reinforce that, I think there's some key components of a basic income, um, and without those, they become something else, a different form of social security payment. So essentially, um, George, right, a, a UBI or a, a basic income is a a regular payment that's made to individuals, not to households. It's a cash payment, so it's not payment in kind, it's not paid in vouchers or, or anything like that. People are free to use it as they will. Um, but crucially for me is it's paid to absolutely everybody in the country, including to children, so it's normally to the parent or the care, um, and that it's unconditional, so it's non-means tested. There's not any um, conditions in terms of you know job applications or how you spend your time. Um, there's not that intrusive um, means tested aspect to it. So I think there's a, a few components of basic income for me that sets that aside from other types of social security that we're perhaps more used to in Scotland and in the UK. In terms of how I could see it working in Scotland, I mean, 
clearly we'll probably go on to some of the, the challenges. So I think I want to try and start with the more positives about what it might do in our society. Um, so the work that, that, that I've done and the others in the, the steering group, looking at the, the feasibility of, of undertaking a pilot in Scotland, which um, again, reasons we'll go on to, has not happened. Um, we did look at the, the available evidence that, that's been published uh, looking from other pilots that's been carried out in the world. And what that's found is that basic income could have really quite a transformative impact on some outcomes, and um, particularly on employment outcomes, labour market, um, health and social um, outcomes. However, there are some mixed, mixed, a bit of a mixed bag. And, and essentially, the, I think the reason for that is that basic income is really difficult to pilot. And usually what happens is that it's ended up being uh, diluted in some form when it's been tested, or um, usually in terms of only being delivered to a certain bit of the, the population, so perhaps long-term unemployed or particular geographical localities, for example. Um, and I think for, for those reasons, whilst it's a really intriguing proposition in terms of um, how we might address some of the tackle some of the issues we're seeing in Scotland, there's some real um, problems with, um, with rather uncertainties around how it might work in practice, both in terms of how do we actually do something like that within a, a social security system that's already set up, and some uncertainties about some of the, the impacts that it might have in terms of people's responses to it and unintended consequences within the broader economy. So I think, um, like John says, it's a really simple idea, but in terms of the, the realities of undertaking such a transformative change to the type of social security we have in Scotland, there's some real um, intricacies and difficulties and challenges around that. So, sorry, not quite as concise as John, but you know. that, that's okay. That was very helpful, though, in, in, in setting out um, uh, some of your work and, and, and where things are. I suppose going back then to you, Wendy, and then I'll bring John in as well. Uh, could you set out how you feel, particularly around poverty, whether or not you think a, a UBI, if we you know, leave to one side the challenges, uh, and we can come to that perhaps later, and I'm sure we'll get teased out in some of the questions from from other participants. Do you think that this has the potential to, you know, have the meaningful shift in addressing poverty that we're all looking to see in Scotland? Yeah, I mean, I think there's the potential there. I think it, um, the, the same as many policies, it boils down to um, how the policy shaped. Uh, how it's implemented and what other policy supports are around about it. So, for example, if um, a UBI was implemented in Scotland and it was implemented in a way that other basic services um, were stopped um, in order to pay for it, and the expectation is if we're, you know if uh, people are being provided with money, they then buy the services. I think that really wouldn't have the the outcomes that we'd expect in terms of poverty alleviation. Um, so, I think we need to be really clear that UBI not a magic bullet, and it has to be sitting alongside a, a range of other support policies like um, universal basic services and and others. I think in terms of the impact that it might have on poverty would also depend on the level that it was set at. So if it's set at a very low level, perhaps it might not have the impact that we would see uh, that, that we would like to see. Uh, and I think the other thing is as well is, is that what it might provide that perhaps the current social security system doesn't is provide a freedom for people to um, move in and out of work and to take some risk perhaps around setting up businesses that's perhaps a bit more difficult within our current social security system where, where really it's quite a risky business moving in and out of that, that uh, social security system and where we find um, people getting caught up in the intricacy of it and like I say the real risks about you know taking um, a chance on, on a job opportunity and it perhaps not working out or it being short term or being not a uh, uh, not secure tenure of contract, or taking a chance and setting up a business, and then it, it, you know perhaps not working. I think something like a basic income perhaps gives a little bit of um, more freedom for people to experiment within the labour market, which is perhaps a bit more difficult um, in the current circumstances. The other thing to remember is that poverty is not just about how much money you've got in your pocket; it's about um, opportunities and, and freedoms and how you feel about. It yourself and um I think um you know there's evidence around um 
the, the, the kind of the impact that it has on people in terms of their mental health, um, having a conditional, a conditions-based uh, social security system. So I think there's lots of different aspects that a UBI could have on poverty. I, I think the main thing that needs to be balanced up with is the opportunity cost of paying for this type of policy versus a more targeted policy where the the, the spend that's available for, for government is, is targeted more at individuals, families and communities that are living in poverty as opposed to a universal payment. Now, I'm not saying one's right and, and one's wrong, but I think that's something that has to be in the mix of the, the debate around this type of policy. Thanks very much, Wendy. That, that again, very helpful. John, if I can bring you in here, something that Wendy touched on there, and we've got a question uh, from the audience as well. Joe in Glasgow is asking, I'm wondering why uh, it should it be five thousand two hundred pounds? Why not six thousand or five thousand, for example? So, could you set out, you know, where the five thousand two hundred figure comes from? Because that that's been worked on, I know. Um, what difference do you think that level could make? And you know what would need to be done if there was a different level, and and, and what impact that could have. Yeah, and it's, it's it's a crux of the issue. I mean, I I wasn't responsible for the five thousand two hundred figure, but my best guess is that five thousand two hundred is a hundred pounds a week, and it's probably used as a demonstrative uh, example rather than a carefully worked out what, what's needed. Uh, and Joe, it's a really important question to ask because if if a universal income was set at five thousand two hundred, then my best guess would be that poverty would increase. I mean, if we, we look at just now what we consider to be a poverty threshold, and the, the, the estimate just now of a poverty threshold for a single adult, so not even thinking about children, a single adult, we, we currently consider somebody to be living in poverty in Scotland if they have an annual income of less than 11,200. That's quite a bit above 5,200. So, I mean, if it was a very simplistic introduction of a, of a universal basic income and there weren't complementary strategies to support the income of the very poorest that actually could have the opposite in, uh, impact than, than intended and actually could increase poverty rather than decrease it. I mean, the, the question that you asked Wendy, you know, we, what kind of impact would it have? I think there's, there's three different answers depending on it's could, should or will. Could it make a difference to poverty? Yes, it could, if it was set at the right level. Could it make a difference to poverty? Maybe. You know, there might be other ways in which there are better strategies to introduce it. And the crux of the matter, will it make a difference to poverty was introduced? And despite the fact I'm an optimist, Neil, my answer would be no. I, I, I don't think the, those with the tools to make a difference have the political commitment or will to introduce a universal basic income at a level that would eradicate poverty to begin with, or perhaps make a, a significant dent in it. Okay, that, that's really interesting, John. Because I'll come on to political will in a second, uh, because I think that, that that's really important. Uh, but around the five thousand two hundred figure, I think this is where it comes into you know what actually we're talking about with the UBI, because certainly the models that I've seen around about that level, you're still involving some level of additional social security. So you've still retained an element of housing support. Or an element of disability support, which kind of makes it a hybrid UBI rather than a dedicated UBI. So, where do you think you've kind of touched on it a wee bit there? But where do you think we would need to get to for an annual figure for us to be starting to address poverty and not have to include um, additional social security support? So you wouldn't have your your disability or housing bolt-ons, if you like. This is where we begin to scare the living daylights out of people because you know if, if we look at the thresholds we have just now, they're considerably more than that five thousand two hundred. I mean, that, and it has to vary because you know it would vary by although the, the UBI goes to an individual. If we talk about the, the volume of money that would have to go to, to households, I mean, the, the, again, I'm, I'm just looking at the, the threshold number just now for a, a couple with two children, age five and fourteen. If you get less than twenty five thousand five hundred pounds, we consider that to be somebody. Who doesn't have the ability in that level of income to fully participate in life? That they're not able to meet their basic needs. We consider you to be living in poverty, and that's an incredible sum of money to try and convince a public that you know that should be the the single strategy that we use to provide social security. So it's a, I mean, it, the idea of meeting everybody's basic needs, the idea of simplifying a system, the idea of allowing flexibility that people can you know have a security that they can uh, you know as Wendy says. Maybe be entrepreneurial and try something different, or you know, take that seasonal job because seasonality of, import, uh, of employment is another benefit for those that work seasonally. Lots of benefits that come from it, 
but the practicalities of it are, are extremely challenging. I, I'm not saying it's not the right idea, full stop. I'm just saying that the, the implications of it are significant. But we should be ambitious. I mean, you know, we never used to have a national health service. We never used to have a, a welfare state system. It's these big ideas that at the time would have, you know, shocked and horrored many in the country that, you know, created a very different nation that we're in today. And maybe it's about time that we started to be more bold and ambitious. You know, maybe it's time we started to ask more of ourselves in terms of the, the type of society we want to create. And at, at the very least, the universal income is certainly worth looking at seriously to see whether it's the not the silver bullet, but the big contribution to transforming what we are. So, Wendy, from your work, um, again, leaving aside the challenges um, of political will, what, what have you, are there barriers at the moment to Scotland looking at a UBI right now? Uh, Yes, there's a <laughs> very short answer to that. Um, if, if I might just go back on the labels uh, 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 discussion. So what we, we were proposing, so the, the idea of the group that, that I um, was uh, leading, we were looking at trying to set up a, a, a kind of small pilot of it because we wanted to test out this. I mean, as John pointed out, this type of a policy is akin to setting up a national health service. Okay, we didn't pilot a national health service. We went for it uh, way back when. But I, I, I mean, I think given that we were starting there with nothing, the health care, you know, to, to NHS. We do have a social security system that's in place just now, and that, you know, some would argue works well, but it, you know, prevents destitution. But it has plenty of problems, and those are well documented. So we'll not get into that there. But we do have something in place, and so we're not starting from the, you know, the, the ground up. So um, we needed to look at. We, we were suggesting that piloting a basic income so that we can compare and contrast it with the current benefit system actually would be important. Um, and to that end, what we proposed was um, piloting two different levels of a basic income. So one that broadly speaking matched, now it's very complex given the complexity of the, the, the current system, that broadly matched what people would get under the, the, the current system. So there would be different levels based on what age you were, etc. We also proposed um, a pilot in a higher level that would be pegged to what was minimum income standards. So what John mentioned, it was about eleven thousand. We worked it out weekly. Two thousand two hundred and thirteen pounds fifty nine for an adult would be the minimum income standard. So we were proposing that we pilot it at two levels because obviously we want to see the impact of the extra income on households and individuals. But we know that generally that's a good thing. What we were interested in, though, was um, looking at the additional benefits of providing money to households and individuals in this way, in this unconditional way. So even if we weren't necessarily putting more money in people's pockets, taking the conditions um, away from that, that payment might actually have um, some benefits over and above increasing out. Uh, Increase, increase in income. So we, what we were proposing is that we would uh, try and pilot it at two different levels so we could see the benefit of providing money in this unconditional way and also the benefit of providing a higher income. So um, leaving that aside, in terms of could we do that in Scotland right now, the short answer is, is no. Um, and the, the reasons, the challenges for that are set out really clearly in the, the feasibility report that was published last year. Um, and essentially, the reason why we couldn't do that, and we were looking specifically at why the feasibility of a pilot rather than the feasibility of the policy overall. But essentially, there's some real um, institutional challenges in doing that, uh, trying to pilot it alongside the current social security system. So for a number of reasons, we can't take people completely out of the, the secu social security and tax system that we have just now, because that has implications down the line. Um, and our, Essentially, our current social security system is built on a system of conditionality. That's built into it. Um, so, to be able to experiment with that conditionality would require quite significant change at Department of Work and Pensions, and essentially at um, UK government level, they would need to kind of allow that experimentation um, to happen. And even underneath that, there's an IT challenges and lots of very technical things that um, I was really quite surprised about. Um, and in terms of Scottish government doing it themselves, but there's obviously issues around um, reserve powers and um, that you know that we're, we're not able to do. So we're not able to um, create social security pay payments that that cut across what's currently provided by DWP. We can't um, create new pensions, for example, either. So. Um, 
So really, in order to be able to pilot a basic income, it would really require the full support of um, I mean, DWP and HMRC, of course, but essentially those are uh, you know reserve powers to um, to UK government. So that was some of the main challenges around um, undertaking a pilot in Scotland at the moment. Which answers one of the questions around political will right now, and we'll come to political will in the future um, shortly. I suppose I, I would hope. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in uh, from the audience, and again, I would encourage. Uh, participants, people who are uh, watching um, live, to uh, pop their questions in the Q and A box, uh, and I'll uh, get through as many of those as possible. Uh, the first one comes from a name that I recognise, Jem Scotland, um, uh, who is a modern studies uh, teacher, uh, teaches social inequalities and government uh, responses to inequality. Uh, her understanding is that one of the advantages of UBI is that it reduces the bureaucracy around means testing, thus allowing the money to be directed to the actual payment. So my question, you know, flowing from that is, you know, if you set the UBI at the right level, if you're reducing the social security bureaucracy, are you saving enough uh, or part of the way towards being able to pay for a UBI, John? Probably in a better position having looked at the intricacies of it, but you know, any system then I think that reduces bureaucracy, any system that, that, that wastes money in administrative procedures is a good is a good system to introduce. I think the crux of the issue that is raised there is the, is the means testing. You know, I mean, in many ways, I think there's dignity issues around about how our social security system currently operates, and we know the strong principles that the Scottish social security system is, is articulated at the start are looking for a very different approach. And I'm, I'm certainly not being party political here, or you know, making comments. This is my independent observation and in the, in the, the character of our, our social support systems. And I think it's just in the, it's got the wrong tenor in the UK. There's almost an assumption in the UK that the people that are presenting for social security are somehow at fault and, and, and somehow have to be kept in check and somehow must prove their entitlement. And, and these are problems, not just problems in terms of dignity. They actually don't marry up with the reality of people's lives. So, you know, I think the quick answer I would give to James Scotland is if there's money to be saved, it would be great. But even if there isn't money to be saved, a more dignified system, you know, a system that doesn't isn't so stringent in means testing and the conditionality is the right system. And that's the type of system that we should be looking for uh, going forward. Thanks, John. Wendy, John reckoned that you might have more detail to add to that. Um, I, I, I think, in in essence, the yeah, I mean, the problem is is that interaction, isn't it, with the the current system that we we have just now. Um, in terms of um, the the underlying principles of conditionality and and means test, I mean, they're there in legislation. You know, there's legislation that underpins that. So, in order to even be able to um, undertake a, even a very small scale pilot, we would actually probably need primary legislative change um, in UK government to, to even do that. So, you know, I'm not making a party political statement here or any sort of political statement. I mean, this is a, it's a matter of fact that, that you, you know, it's, it's the legal constitution of our current social security system makes it quite difficult to, um, to, to make any changes to, to some of these things. And in terms of um, the savings, of course, you know, reducing bureaucracy, I think, is a, is a good thing, not only for cost savings, but for individuals that are interacting with that system. It's, it's not just about the dignity aspect; it's, a, it's about navigating the system in a way that actually you, you, know, that you get access to everything that you're entitled to. I mean, we know that we have um, under um, under claiming of our current benefit system, and there's many reasons for that. Um, I think there's also quite a lot of stress. That, that sits alongside a conditional um, conditional system when people know that their, their, their benefits can be removed from them for a period of time, and, and essentially, you know, it's kind of destitution built, built into the system. So that's um, I, I think that's also potentially a benefit of basic income. Going back to something that you mentioned at the start, Neil, though, is that there's always going to be additional needs that's over and above these basic needs that a basic income might provide for. So there's additional costs that go along with a lot of disabilities. Um, you know, you might be, um, you know, living in an area where there's very high housing costs as well. So a basic income is never going to be able to meet 
all of the needs of individuals and the, the complexities of people's lives and, and you know, their, their geographical area. So I think even with a very simplified system like a, a basic income, there is always going to be an additional layer of more targeted support required. And I'm saying that particularly in, in the case of um, people living with disability where they do have additional financial needs and also perhaps in terms of child um, child care as well so that was the other thing in addition to housing needs where I think there's additional things so there's all I think to be able to adequately um, support people in the complexities of their lives they're all there is probably always going to need to be an element of means testing um, in, in some way, shape or form. But I think we can probably do it better than we do just now. And, and like John says, with a with an eye to dignity um, and, and respect for, for individuals in the way that they interact with that system. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, Wendy. Um, yeah. Got a comment in from uh, Archana, uh, who says the lack of dignity also affects self-esteem and mental health. There's shame associated with benefits. And I think that touches on some of the points that you were making there, John, and also leads uh, me to the next question that we've uh, got from the audience uh, who are watching live. Uh, again, a reminder, if you've got any questions, pop them in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, this question is actually from one of your students, uh, Leanne, Glasgow Caledonian University student. Would it not be better to look at the benefit system overall and so-called legacy benefits? Universal credit can constantly change. As opposed to the original legacy benefits, universal credit appears to have caused more upset with the constant changes than anything else. Um, come, you're nodding, Wendy. I'll come to you first. Yeah, sorry, I'm kind of kind of laughing at something. I'm not laughing. It's like absolutely and deadly serious. But the the fact that we still have people in Scotland uh, on legacy benefits and majority on uh, universal credit posed posed additional complexity for us trying to um trying to perhaps experiment with something like a basic income because if we um took people off legacy benefits put them onto a basic income within the pilot they couldn't then return to legacy benefits they had to then go into the universal uh, the sorry the, the uh, universal credit system so there was some additional complexities there that we faced in terms of trying to do this type of um research um so yes, um, in terms of the the benefits or not of universal credit, I think probably John is more uh, well versed with that. But certainly, I think one of the the problems is the lack of certainty around um, income. Tons, you know, heaps of evidence around um, the the impact of economic insecurity on people and their mental health um, and physical health actually down the line. Um, and that's certainly one thing. As a you know, I'm, I'm a public health professional. That's you know, my eye is always on um, what's the, the health impacts on on uh, folks, particularly mental health impact. That's one of the areas that's probably a bit stronger in terms of some of the evidence of of um, previous basic income experiments that's been done worldwide. You know, all of the the issues with those um, experiments aside, they're usually pretty clear in terms of the, the positive impacts on the, the mental health and well-being of participants um, for a, a number of reasons. So I think it is really important um, and it's certainly something we need to look at in terms of our current social security system. John, to follow on from that? A couple of answers. First of all, I've got to clarify, this isn't a plan. This question, Neil, Leanne can think for herself. She's, she's not averse to keeping her, uh, her lecturers and professors right if they go wrong. So. Um, it's a genuine question. A couple of answers, as I said, the way to approach this. I, I think it's interesting because you know the, the whole idea of universal credit was meant to be transformative. It was meant to be a new idea to simplify the the benefit system, and as we know, it very quickly unravelled because the way in which it was introduced didn't really deal with some of the realities of life and the level at which the, the, the money was available wasn't dealing with the problem. So again, that idea about fundamental change is something we tried, or at least a, a Step towards a fundamental change, it didn't work, and it comes back again to it. It, it, it is a good idea to be fundamentally changing our welfare system. It's not working well. It would be a good idea if and only if everything is in place to to allow that change to happen. I think the reality is Wendy's pointed out for a variety of reasons that's really difficult just now, and actually politically impossible just to introduce it in Scotland on its own just now. So I think in the meantime, in the short term, given the reality of people's lives. 
we have to make the current benefit system work better. Absolutely have to. Now, that's not to say if we get that to work better that we shouldn't at some stage move towards looking at a minimum income guarantee, a idea we have in Scotland, or a universal basic income. It's not to say that we shouldn't move towards that, but absolutely priority just now is getting that system to deliver social security, to deliver what it's meant to do, and it's not at the current time. So, quick answer to Leanne is we need to get the current system working better, but that doesn't mean if we begin to get it working a little bit better that we shouldn't be looking to these bigger ideas that would be truly transformative in terms of what we are. And I suppose for students watching, for others that are interested in this area, looking at the difference between what we mean by social security, welfare, and, and the different terms that we have there, I think is, is really important as we look to address poverty. But, but going back to the comment from Archana around, you know, really the impact that you know the struggles with the social security system, um, as we're hearing from comment, as we're hearing from yourselves. Isn't necessarily addressing need at the moment, um, and the implication that that has on poverty and the physical, uh, emotional health implications that that has. Wendy, could you touch on really the the, the impact that poverty has on people's well-being, on their physical, emotional, uh, mental health uh, state? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think I probably you know everyone sitting in this. Uh, the, the the virtual room um, kind of knows that it's much more than just having enough money or not to kind of meet the basic needs. Although that I mean that's just so important. You know, if you don't have um, enough money, you're having to make choices between you know heating your home and clothing your kids, eating healthily or or, or otherwise. You know, it impacts on every single bit of um, your your life, um, you know, having to perhaps make decisions about, you know, travelling um, to to work or for, for for leisure pursuits, or being able to actually participate in things. That all of the things that people are being bombarded bombarded with in terms of messages about what you should be doing to look after yourselves and to live a healthy life. Actually, there's um, you know, there's so many financial barriers put in in the way of people being able to to do that. But more, moreover than it just being, and John's already spoken about it. I mean, it's a dignity thing. It's about the shame of not being able to participate in those ways, and not um, being able to have your family participate in things that you see others round about um, doing. So, the impact um, of, of poverty is just so far, far ranging and, and intergenerational. It's not something that stops, you know, just with you. It impacts on your kids and, and the next generation in terms of. Um, you know, both the, the, the kind of physical stature, or, you know, have your kids been, you know, had had the right kind of nutrition to, to grow the, the way that they might have otherwise, and and to have the kind of social life and educational life. Um, I know that there's lots of um, features on 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 the line. You know, the attainment gap is so clearly linked to to poverty and. Um, the ability to have that in, enriched home environment and to partake in all of the opportunities that perhaps are available at school, so it, it, it kind of impacts on every single area of of your life. And we, you know, I would would term it we've got a fundamental cause of of health inequalities. You know, that socioeconomic gradient that that we see in Scotland is in, intrinsically linked to the poor health record that we have in Scotland and the, the health inequalities. We have. Huge gaps in both life expectancy and healthy life expectancy related to um, that socio-economic gap and gradient that we have in Scotland. So tackling poverty, I kind of see as is, is, is kind of number one priority really if we want to impact on our um, social justice outcomes or health outcomes. It, tackling poverty has to be the absolute root of that. You're nodding along to that there, John. It's getting sore with how much nodding I'm doing as Wendy was, was speaking there. I mean, the, the two big priorities that Scotland have got, and the two big priorities going forward, is tackling climate change and tackling poverty. Absolutely no doubt about it. Both of these are equally important. There's a fusion of issues, which is for another debate or another day, about you know how these issues actually are not contradictory, but must complement as we craft a, a better Scotland going forward. But you know, Wendy's right. The impacts of poverty go far beyond pounds and pence in people's pocket. I've, I've carried throughout my career a, a quote from a, a, an interview I had very early on. It was up in Murray with a, a, a lone parent who talked about treating herself from time to time by getting herself a nice bar of soap and having a bath. And you know that really did struck me. It really just hit me hard that the, the different types of life that people lead 
and an understanding of really, you know, how life is very different. The horizons are very different. Opportunities are, are very different for many groups. And I think for a long time we've been able to shut. Our, you know, many in Scotland have been able to shut themselves off from that. Last year brought it into to focus that we couldn't because it was becoming to the fore that people were struggling to feed themselves. And we began to realise actually that these core public services we've got, our school meal service, for example, were fundamentally important in allowing people to exist, never mind live. So I think the last year brought it into sharp focus. Clear from Grant and Spade, you know, asked the question, why is citizens' income becoming a discussion now? I think a lot of thinking's been going on for it for a long time. But what happened over the last eighteen months or so is we began to realise these fundamental problems we have are really pretty significant. You know, and it's easy to throw out a number, a million people living in poverty and sort of suddenly kind of to shut off from it. But last year we began to see things differently. We began to realise things aren't working as well as they could work, aren't working as well as they should work. And that far too many of our fellow citizens, um, which comes back to another point we should we should pick up with one of the others, you know, is that citizens are residents uh, this is geared at. You know, far too many of our citizens and residents uh, are, are not living a good life because simply our, our social support systems are failing them. So, in that vein, then, question from Anne in Edinburgh: Given that living in poverty is incredibly stressful, and that constant stress is known to adversely affect cognition, uh, if a UBI works, how how do you see a UBI affecting mental health, Wendy? Um, yeah, I think I'd mentioned earlier that that was some of the probably clearer evidence from the work that's that's been done, where um, basic income or basic income type. Um, pilots have been done um, elsewhere. Um, I think that the first thing it does is, is removes that kind of constant underlying stress that you have of, you know, this um, this social security payment could be withdrawn from me. You know, so for a start, I mean, that's a really really basic one that you know you're not having to meet conditions that that in this current climate and and over the last eighteen months have got more difficult and more difficult. You know, so if you're living in an area of low job density um and you're having to meet um uh you know a, a, a conditionality or work contracts they're called I can't remember or uh, work seeking contracts, you know, you may have already applied for all of the jobs that's available in your area. So you know there's some really basic things about it's not just about people's willingness to um to, to take a job or to take a job that they like, it's actually about what's available in your area. And we know that there's some real big regional inequalities in job density in Scotland, and um, and, and not only about the number of jobs available, but actually the right types of jobs. You know, so is it what people um, in that area are skilled up to do? Uh, so we can then get into whole discussions about economic regeneration and bringing business into areas. But actually, what you're ending up doing is bringing in the labour as well, instead of it being a sort of local community benefit. And so, um, I think there's lots of different aspects that a basic income could impact um, beneficially on people's mental health. Um, I think there's more that we can do, like I say, within the, the current benefit system to try and, and improve that as well. But I think um, what it, for me, fundamentally, what it does is opens up horizons for people. The things that would perhaps be closed down just now with the current um, the, the current uh, conditionality rules. You know, someone might decide actually, I want to go back to college and learn. You know, to learn something to try and improve the, the job prospects down the line. So yes, that might see them sort of um, taken out of the labour market for a year, but ultimately they're going to have a better outcome at the end of that, and that might not actually be. Um, a possible outcome for them just now within universal credit. So there's lots of, I guess for me, it's about opening up opportunities, perhaps. I, I think that security that you talk about there, Wendy, is one of the key attractions that many proponents of UBI uh, put forward as being the key reason for them that they think it, it, it would be a useful thing to do in terms of, like you say, going uh, reskill to move on to be entrepreneurial, which you've talked about already, to be creative, to have time uh, to work in the creative industries and to volunteer as well, and, and potentially recognise the work of unpaid uh, volunteers. Uh, but you touched on an area there, uh, Wendy, around uh, labour market, which um, is both topical and uh, touched on a question uh, from Darren Wallace in Glasgow, John. And that uh, question is, how would the implementation of a UBI impact on labour shortages? This is one of the key questions uh, that get posed about whether or not a UBI would suppress 
um, you know, the employment prospects and the prospects of employers to take people on? What What do you think? I think that there's a lot of myths about employment. A lot there's a myth just now that somehow the, the the welfare system is a great disincentive for many many people to enter the world of work. Now there are problems in in terms of um, we don't get the full return when we return to work from the welfare system, and there is so it would be illogical for some people in social security just now to to move into work because they would lose too much. Now I do accept that, but it's overstated. It's greatly overstated. I think what happens from those cases is, ex is extrapolated to the whole welfare system as if there is a real disincentive to work in the whole of the welfare system, which is not the case. And I think likewise in terms of UBI, it's, it's maybe overstated the, the, the potential of that to open up the world of work because it's not a problem that's as big as people make out in the first place. I think that it's back to the, 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 the tail end of your response to the last question, Neil. It provides security for people to be more creative, you know, to be more entrepreneurial, to have that security. That would allow them to not be forced into labour market options, but to choose labour market options. I mean, if I think of my son just now, my, my son is a, a freelance uh, community arts is, is his thing. He, he loves working with young people. He loves working um, with ages, different ranges of projects. But he, jo he moves from job to job. He's had a horrible couple of months because work's not been available. The risk is you're, you're going to use some, lose somebody like that to the sector for talent and passion because they can't sustain that type of career. You know, and I'm not saying that UBI would be good because it would, um, you know, would allow poor employment practices to persist. But at least it gives him a bit of breathing space. I think to think, right, I can sustain that because I've got a bit of security. I'm not desperate and need to leave it behind. And to me, there are lots of advantages like that in terms of the labour market, which I think Wendy's picked up on. It allows that labour market to be more of a choice for people rather than a forced, uh, a forced option. Well, not an option, but actually, but a been forced into the labour market because needs are, are, are such that you have to enter it. That's not a, I mean, that's simply not a good thing. Wendy, a question here that's probably uh, for you, um, given your study in this. A question from uh, Mortada: Is the proposed UBI for citizens or for residents? So who who, who would get it under the models that you've looked at? Okay, so. Um... I will hold my hands up and say that we fudged that ever so slightly because I think that's very much a political discussion. Um, we um, did; uh, we, it wasn't in our original um, business plan, but we ended up spending quite a lot of time looking at some of the ethical issues around a basic income, particularly around piloting a basic income, um, and the the very issue that was raised um, from Matada about you know. What's the eligibility for a basic income was something that we discussed but didn't come to a conclusion on. I think it is something that is a particularly tricky one about how do you decide when someone is um, eligible and, and you know is it around um, citizenship uh, and how do we define that? Um, I think there's a lot of rhetoric around um, the current social security system about folks coming to. The UK to, to to receive benefits, and I think that has only magnified that 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 perhaps argument or misperception might only be magnified when looking at a basic income, and it is something that would require probably a bit more of a public debate and um, political debate around around how do we set those um, conditionality rules. And I think it's not it wasn't really for us as researchers or public health or, or local or local government officers to make that. That call, but we did raise it amongst a whole range of other potential ethical issues that would need to be discussed. Um, if I may just go back um, a wee bit just to that whole um, debate around the labour market. Now, it's something that we looked at quite closely in the basic income study that, that we did, because we know that it's one of the biggest um, sort of arguments made against the basic income. That you know, all it would do is um, would encourage folk to withdraw from the labour market. And in terms of the, the research that we looked at from what had been done before, um, we certainly found that, that wholesale folks did, did not withdraw from the labour market. That's not what we saw. Um, we saw quite a mixed picture. Um, and I think it does get down to kind of some discussions we tip that we need to have about what kind of society we want to live in. So where we did see folk um, withdrawing, at least for a period of time from the labour market, it was very specific groups of folk. So um, usually women with young children, so families, um, would spend more time in the home, spend more time with children when they were young. Now, we could get into a whole debate around gender roles and whether that's good, but 
you know, we would need to look at what other support policies would be around there to en encourage um, dads to be able to take that role. Um, so we did see some withdrawal, temporary withdrawal from the labour market. Now, whether we see that as a positive or a negative, I think depends on sort of where, where you come from or, you know, kind of your view of that. We also saw um, in some of the studies people, um, young people staying in education for longer before taking their first steps into the labour market. So that would have been seen, uh, I guess, by some, depending on your viewpoint, as a, as a positive or a negative. Um, and then actually, for some groups, we saw them increasing um, their um, hours because they were perhaps able to spend some time getting a better job or something that they enjoyed more or was more they felt more productive in. So there was a real mixed bag around the impact of basic income on labour market. Now, how that would play out in Scotland, it's not entirely clear. We have some very specific issues around the labour market, which um, people will be well aware of. Um, particularly just now in some sectors, we have a, a, a real shortage of, of labour. Now, a basic income, I, I don't think necessarily would have a, a particular positive or negative impact on that, given some of the, the issues you know, around lorry drivers and training. And particularly the conditions around um, folks working. Um, I know John mentioned that we wouldn't want to see a basic income supporting poor labour practices and poor, poor workforce um, practices. You know, so we wouldn't want it, for example, to become um, uh, some sort of um, support to, to a low wage economy, or you know, you know, to kind of you know to support those kinds of, uh, of labour practices. So. Uh, we would really need to have an eye on the other policies that were round about it in terms of em employment uh, law and, and, and other policies as well. So I think um, there are a lot of misconceptions around what it might do in the labour market. Yeah, debunking the misconception around the labour market criticisms, was that's very interesting to hear. And also the point that you were making around uh, the misconceptions there are around people coming to the UK in order to get access to the generous social security system that that, that could be quite quickly debunked when you compare the generosity of the UK system compared to some of our European neighbours, uh, particularly when you look at uh, as a proportion of average earnings. Um, we've got another question uh, here uh, from Peter in Edinburgh. Um, uh, perhaps uh, briefly from yourself, Wendy, and then also from John. Uh, have such systems been tried or even adopted anywhere else in the world? And if so, with what level of success? Uh, yeah, so um, so Peter, there's been a number of different studies done, um, and we can take learning from different things. So you've probably been aware of some of the, the studies that have been done. So there was a pilot of sorts of basic income in Finland recently and in Canada. The Netherlands. There's a number of different pilots um, going on in the United States, um, and I mean, there's been experiments with basic income as far back as 1970s, and, and probably even before that. But in terms of published literature, um, there's quite a lot um, written as well. There's been some pilots in um, in um, other countries, sort of low income, low and medium uh, income countries, all with, I guess. Know, varying degrees of success, but crucially, all with varying, very um, varied models um, and, and very different levels of income. So, um, uh, some of them in response to different things. So, there was um, an, an Iranian subsidy um, that was created that was a basic income of sorts, and it was so there had been some subsidies around um, around some basic foodstuffs that were being withdrawn. So, there was a basic income type payment made to the households to um, to make up for that, but given other economic pressures, actually it was it, it very quickly became a very small amount of money just because of inflation in the country and whatnot. So there's been lots of different types of studies that have been done that's looked at basic income or other policies that have essentially worked sort of in the same ways as basic income. So um, in Alaska, there's a dividend. Uh, a sort of, um, dividend scheme where there's an annual payment made um, to individuals in Alaska that works sort of as a basic income, and there's been lots of studies done around that. Um, also, in some of the um, some areas in uh, in America where there's been casinos um, on built on and um, reservations, so Native um, American um, casino dividends as well. And again, the way that they are structured has given their eyes to some quite 
interesting impacts. So some of those types of things have, have um, given a rise to very big annual payments for, for some individuals that, that, that kind of gives mixed responses um, in, in terms of the outcomes, particularly health outcomes. So you might see, for example, an increase of risk-taking behaviour after a, a big payment. So I mean, in, in the, the, the casino dividend studies, what happens with the, the uh, young people's payments is it's put in a bank account and they get access to it a certain age and it can run in multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars and you know we could we actually seen an increase in mortality after um you know receipt of these payments so there can be some very specific types of outcomes depending on the way that the um the, the basic income or the the intervention um is uh, set up obviously that's quite different from what we'd be looking at in Scotland so you would really design your intervention based on what outcomes you were trying to achieve um but I think, like I said earlier, what's probably quite stark and is quite um, similar across the different types of studies are the labour market interventions. Are, uh, sorry, labour market outcomes are perhaps not what the myths would um, suggest. And there's usually quite clear outcomes and benefits on mental health of participants. So, yeah, lots and lots of studies and there's reports out there. I can put some links in the chat afterwards if people want to look at that. That would be wonderful for Wendy. Uh, that would be great. Thank you very much. Conscious as I am of, of time, um, I, I think uh, the question from Claire and Granton and Spey about why do you think the discourse about universal basic income has entered public discussions recently? Is it because the current system is so bad or the payments being made during the pandemic? I think John largely answered that, unless uh, the two of you have got something specific that you'd want to say in addition. But we've got a few meaty questions um, on top of that that I would look to get into. And I'm conscious with nine minutes to go, we haven't even touched on how this could be paid for, the impact on the taxation system. So my next question is a bit of a hybrid in that regard. Um, Joe in Glasgow is asking what the panel's thoughts on Andrew Yang's proposal during the 2020 election to give $1,000 to each American adult every month which is kind of close to the report from the New Economics Foundation, which suggested um, uh, £200 a week um, uh, and uh, with no means testing. But if people earned over 30000 a year, it could be clawed back the following year. So looking at an element of means testing, look at an element of how it could be paid for. John, what, what do you reckon to those? First of all, the, the idea from Andrew Yang during the uh, U.S. elections, and also um, the idea of using the tax system in our years to to recoup some of that money to those that maybe don't need it. I mean, I, mean, I think the, the the basic principle of Yang's idea is they give people money when they need it. So the basic idea is good; it's okay. The idea of clawing it back, I think, is highly problematic, and it doesn't really deliver the best of what a universal system would be. So I think that 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 means is is not ideal. Because back to like, the custom McKechnie's uh, also asked out a question about would it not just be a subsidy for the rich? And kind of bundling that together with this question, not necessarily. I mean, if if UBI was crafted in the right way, then you know the the higher income tax would be paid. And yes, they might get five thousand two hundred if we stuck with that figure, but they would be paying more than five thousand two hundred in tax to to claw it back if it was designed properly. And it's all that big if. You know, and the, the, the question that Wendy was asked uh, answered previously about learning from other countries, uh, and I'm not just trying to create more work for Wendy over the years. We, we have to think about the context. We have to think about what we want here in Scotland. Just because it worked or didn't work elsewhere doesn't mean to say that it's going to work or not going to work in Scotland. We have to think about what type of country we are, what we want, and how it would be designed in a way that could work. So all of these issues are, unfortunately, there is no answer that is definitive. It's maybe. You know, maybe it could work if we decide to implement it in the right way. And the decision about whether we write, implement it in the right way comes back to what type of country we, do we want. Do we want one that's more egalitarian, that's not punitive, that offers opportunity, that doesn't create barriers that don't need to be there? And again, I, I've got to link back to Murtada and, and give a, a punter's response to Murtada's question rather than an expert. Is it for citizens or residents? I don't want to live in a country where uh, a basic income is only for the citizens. I want it to be for the residents. That's a personal opinion, and it's something about you know what this citizen's income or what this universal basic income, what we call it, what it's trying to achieve. It's trying to achieve a country that provides security for all, and I don't think it's credible for a system that would seek to provide security for all to leave out some people that happen to be living in our country that actually are in pretty perilous conditions. You know, your asylum seekers, uh, refugees. So. If it comes in, uh, when it comes in, I want it to be a resident's income rather than just a citizen's income. That's purely a personal opinion. 
Uh, Wendy, uh, turning to another question from uh, Jim Scotland, um, and again, this kind of, uh, you know, it, it, I suppose is going to be caveated by what John's just said there that there are no definitive answers right now. But another positive impact Jim is saying of the basic income is in reducing gender inequality. Single parents more likely to be uh, female, female affecting employment. Also, in the study done in America during Nixon's presidency, the reason it was not pursued was that it increased the level of divorce rates. Women were more likely, more no longer financially dependent on abusive relationships. So, can you comment further on the gender impact of UBI, Wendy? Yeah, um, that's, that's really interesting that that's picked up because we looked at that, and particularly myself and um, my colleague uh, Marcia Gibson at Glasgow Uni when we were looking at the the, the previous. Um, the, the previous uh, studies that have been done, and that's why I think it's really, really important to be clear about what outcomes you're trying to achieve and what outcomes you're measuring at the start. So, what happened in that experiment in the 1970s was that um, there was an analysis done that looked at uh, divorce rates and, um, you know, find that divorce went up, and that ended that, that kind of killed the policy stone dead in that particular political climate. Subsequent analysis that was done found, um, sort of after the way, after the studies were finished, found that actually the divorce rate hadn't gone up after all. So there was a political decision based on some flawed research there. Um, in terms of the the gender impact, again, I think um, it's something that we would want to have an eye to if we were um, to pilot it or implement it in Scotland. I think it could it could be um, beneficial. It could be detrimental. So. Um, one of the things that we are kind of aware of is that it could reinforce gender roles, particularly around um, child, you know, kind of um, caregiving and, and child care, because it, it, it would kind of take pressure off um, that allow people to, to um, look after young children, look after elderly parents. But we do, would we want to be um, reinforcing that gender role? I'm not sure that we would, but I guess for me then, what it, you know what comes down to is what other policies in place around about it that, that allows that uh, those responsibilities to be shared. Um, I, I can see just in the comments about people being able to leave abusive relationships, and indeed that um, that might be the case. I mean, obviously we know that sort of financial abuse can can happen in, in multiple ways. So just you know even. That if the payment is made to that individual doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know they would always have um, direct access. So we need to be careful about how that was constructed and works that were in place for for folks in that kind of um, that kind of relationship, uh, uh, that kind of abusive situation. So I think it's not really clear what the impact, the, the, the gender impact would be, but I think it's something that we would need to build into any piloting so that we were. Um, of measuring the right things and looking at the right things and, and designing it in a way that would achieve the outcomes that, that we're interested in. Thanks very much, Wendy. I've got a final question, uh, conscious of the fact that we're due to stop at two, but I suspect we might go slightly over. Um, so, as briefly as possible, please. Um, would Farm Higher Modern Studies class? Uh, so, thank you very much for participating, folks. Uh, we wanted to know if you think the UBI will help close the attainment gap in schools, especially gaps caused by the pandemics when lots of uh, pandemic when lots of young people didn't have access to the ICT they needed and a safe place to work. Forty-five seconds, John and Wendy. John first, please. No, it won't do that, um, and we shouldn't expect that universal basic income to solve every single challenge that Scotland has. Uh, what we need in terms of the attainment gap is the, so the Scottish Attainment Challenge version two, which has been crafted just now to be much more effective uh, than the Scottish Attainment Challenge ver uh, version one. Um, so it, it will perhaps make a, an element of a difference, and the, the families are better resourced and they're better able to support their children's education. But much more has to be done. If we want to narrow that attainment gap, and it goes way beyond putting more pounds and pence in somebody's pocket, despite the fact that is really important, we need to do more. Wendy, yeah, just to take a slightly more positive view, whilst I don't disagree with John, absolutely more has to be done in terms of the, the structures and um, you know schools and, and policy to close that attainment gap. I think there is a potential for basic income to 
um, not only pr help provide a more enriched environment at home, but also to reduce that that stress that you know the stress on on parents and on the household. Um, and I think that you know that does um, feed over into how kids are able to perform at school and how parents are able to support kids. So I think there is the potential for there to be a positive element um, of of basic income in terms of attainment. However, it's going to be a small part of it. And like John says, there's much more specific targeted work to be done there as well. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed uh, this afternoon. I think it's been fascinating. We've touched on so much in terms of UBI, in terms of anti-poverty work and, and a number of other areas linked to it. Uh, if they're looking to give each of you a minute uh, to just to summarise uh, where you think we are, some of the things that we've discussed, if you would like, um, before we uh, draw the meeting to a close. So, first of all, I'll ask Wendy uh, if you've got anything that you'd like to summarise, and, and then John. Um, I think what I would say is that it's just I think it's great that in Scotland we're having these debates about radical approaches to tackling some of the problems that we we have, and that we have the opportunity to pose some of these more um, radical solutions. We've seen some of the challenges around doing that. What well, I'm really pleased to say that the work that we did around um, exploring the feasibility of a basic income pilot didn't stop at a report describing all the challenges. It has been absolutely taken on board by the Scottish Government and kind of working with that and the potential for more radical solutions. And it's very much feeding into the current debates and the current work around the minimum income guarantee. Um, it's going to be a long road, I think, to, to, to changing our social security system in Scotland to, to provide um, that, that real security that we would want to see for our residents in Scotland. Um, and I'm really pleased to have been part of that, that journey and, and, and very much hope to continue to be part of that. Thank you very much, Wendy. John? Thanks, Neil. I'm going to do the unpopular thing and, and praise a politician because uh, you, you've managed, Neil, to allow us to answer every question that was posed by a, a very engaged audience, and thank the audience for that as well. Um, but back to the question then, you know, looking forward, I think there's a, a long term and a short term. Uh, long term, I think, as Wendy says, it's right that we're looking for these transformative ideas about the country that we want to become. But, and it's a big but, we aren't able to introduce universal basic income right now, so we need to use the tools at our disposal more effectively right now to address the challenges that people in Scotland are facing right now. Thanks very much uh, to you both. I, I, I actually have to correct you, John, even though you're praising me. Uh, there was a, a question in the chat box there from Pauline in West Lothian. It's something that I would have really liked us to engage with, coming as I do from Orkney, around whether we think a UBI would begin to affect birth rates or depopulation in rural areas. It, it, I think what this has shown us is there is a huge engagement in the issue around poverty, uh, around the ideas that we're looking to uh, discuss to address poverty. I think there is a unanimity across people that are engaged in, in this area, uh, yourselves included, uh, uh, around the need to address poverty. And the fact that we're discussing potential ideas as radical as UBI would be, I think, uh, is is heartening and uh, very helpful for our public discourse and where we should be. I want to thank uh, both Wendy uh, and John uh, for your contributions, and also uh, those who have been watching live and posed questions. Really appreciate. Uh, your time this afternoon. I uh, would like to also uh, thank uh, Glasgow Caledonian University for the partnership working today. Um, obviously, thank our panellists, Professor John McKendrick and Wendy Harty, uh, for your time as well. I may take this opportunity before you all go to remind you that later on today we have discussions on education's role in big building a sustainable society at five o'clock. And over the weekend, we'll also be discussing everything from fast fashion to a just transition, uh, diversity in Scottish politics and climate, uh, uh, climate action. So I hope you can join those discussions around the Festival of Politics as well. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, including the Scottish parliamentary team, uh, for making sure that this event went smoothly today. Thank you very much. <laughs>